Okay, welcome everybody. Um, super excited to introduce Dr. Sarah Valentine, who's a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in psychiatry at Boston Medical Center and Boston University School of Medicine. She is the director of the Program of Research and Implementation Science, Minority Stress and Mental Health, PRISM, like that acronym, and the director of uh, BMC's Restore Center, Recovery from Stress and Trauma through Outpatient Care, Research and Education. Dr. Valentine's program of research focuses on the adaptation and implementation of evidence-based treatments for PTSD in safety net hospital and community-based settings, with a focus on expanding treatment models to duly address oppression-based stress. She specializes in the use of participatory methods to adapt and promote the sustainability of interventions. Um, Dr. Kelly Harper is currently an investigator in the Behavioral Sciences Division of the National Center for PTSD with a PhD in clinical psychology and has specialized training in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Harper was recently awarded a Veterans Affairs Clinical Science Research and Development Funded Career Development Award to develop and test a brief expressive writing-based intervention to address sexual minority stress among sexual minority veterans. Their research has focused on biopsychosocial risk factors for psychopathology, as well as the utilization and effectiveness of mental health treatment. They've established a solid research foundation in the biopsychosocial framework, which they apply to current work on sexual and gender minority stress, psychopathology, and intervention development and adaptation. They also serve as the chair of the ISTSS Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity Special Interest Group and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator at the National Center for PTSD Behavioral Science Division. We're very lucky to have um, two very um, esteemed colleagues here, and I am going to um, mute myself and pass it, um, pass the mic over. Um, please join me in a warm welcome. Okay, awesome. Um, so great introduction. We're both very excited to be here to talk to you all today um, about adapting treatments for uh, LGBTQ plus uh, youth. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, which will give us an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about different models of social stress that help explain why LGBTQ plus people have heightened risk uh, for mental health problems. And then next, Dr. Valentine will review different ways of integrating uh, social stress or oppression-based stress into uh, treatment uh, with a specific focus on talking about assessment uh, related to trauma and oppression-based stress and then also talk about why cognitive behavioral therapy is a useful modality for uh, targeting both PTSD related symptomatology and also being inclusive of oppression-based stress. Uh, following the introduction of talking about why CBT is helpful for this, we're gonna talk about specific interventions for PTSD and how they can be adapted for LGBTQ plus people and to be inclusive of oppression-based stress. And we're gonna break that up by first talking about exposure-based interventions and how those can be adapted, and then talk about uh, cognitive interventions and how they can be adapted. Um, anything else? Uh, so I'll talk about the exposure-based work and then Dr. Valentine will talk about the cognitive-based work. Go ahead and advance. All right. Um, so some of you are probably familiar with this model. Uh, this is just to orient all of us. So whenever I start out this talk, I like to say like what we do know, we do know that LGBTQ plus people experience higher risk and higher severity of different negative mental health and health outcomes. And this is inclusive. It includes, but not just includes things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and also risk for suicide. Um, so we know that these significant mental health disparities are also due to the stigmatized position that LGBTQ plus people have in society. And to be clear, this is not due to anything intrinsically different about LGBTQ plus individuals. This is due to how society and also the socio-political environment views and treats LGBTQ plus people. And because of that, um, 
that has a negative impact on mental health. And this is articulated based on this minority stress model that was originally developed by Brooks in the 80s and then also worked on by Myers, who um, is frequently cited for it in 2003. So, you know, what this model says is that LGBTQ plus individuals are at elevated risk for negative health outcomes, not just because they experience same stressors as everyone does, which are depicted in the green arrows, but they also experience uh, distal stressors, which are depicted in this red. And these are things such as identity-based discrimination and victimization. Uh, and these experiences, discrimination, victimization, or even the expectation of these experiences can give rise to what we call proximal or internal stress reactions, such as shame, uh, expectations for rejection. And this you know, impacts people by increasing demands to conceal one's minority identity. Another way that I like to think about this is that distal stressors, discrimination, victimization are the stressors and these proximal stressors, so they call them, is the reactions to the stressors. So these are the reactions to stress. And so if you think about it, if people experience discrimination, they're gonna learn to expect rejection in the future. And so then they might engage in different activities or strategies to then conceal their identity to protect themselves from rejection. And we'll talk about that idea of concealment and outness a little bit more in treatment. Um, but this is something that, you know, a lot of LGBTQ plus individuals do to conceal their identity, prevent themselves from pain or from harm or from rejection. Um, but it can be really complicated. So some, you know, regard this as an important and privileged option that does offer protection. And also concealment can come at, you know, many psychological, emotional, and interpersonal costs to individuals. So we'll talk more about how to balance that and think about that in treatment. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, another way to think about oppression-based stress is to conceptualize individuals as existing within an ecological system. So within the system, individuals are exposed to direct interaction with close others like friends, family within their microsystem. So examples of oppression-based stress here might be things like family rejection or bullying from peers. And then you can go to the next slide. And then individuals also must contend with more distal stressors from the local community. So like family, from schools, from healthcare sitting, settings in the exosystem. And then the next, the macro systems are even more distal stressors at the macro level. And this involves like cultural influences, things like laws, things like policies that disproportionately disadvantage LGBTQ plus individuals or exclude them from their protections. So things like policies that exclude LGBTQ plus individuals from housing or employment non-discrimination or laws that restrict in teaching practices or in healthcare that can be provided. You can go to the next. Um, as I'm sure many people are aware of, uh, we have a seriously large number of bills that are anti-LGBTQ plus bills in the U.S. right now. Uh, I just checked, I think yesterday, yes, as of uh, April 2010, there are 453 bills targeting the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and putting this into the ecological model, these bills serve as macro system level stressors. So you know, they're the bills to the policy, they're the culture that people are living within, but if they are passed, they also impact things in other aspects of the exosystem. Um, so things like what school will look like, what healthcare can be provided. Um, so just to orient us a little bit to how oppression-based stress can impact LGBTQ plus individuals' mental health. Uh, so now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Valentine to talk more about ways that violence and oppression-based stress are intertwined. Yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, there are high rates of inter interpersonal trauma exposure among LGBT uh, plus populations, and this is true across the lifespan. Um, and in addition, LGBT plus inter individuals may also be subject to discrimination, hate crimes, or microaggressions. And so um, we like to think of the cumulative burden of these adverse life experiences creating a particular vulnerability for the development of PTSD after exposure of trauma. 
So not only a vulnerability to higher um, initial exposure to trauma, but also um, ways in which identity or uh, minoritization might impact the recovery process. Um, and and the, we'll sort of give the, the broad view here around sort of our case for CBT as being well suited broadly for LGBTQ plus uh, individuals. And one is that it locates the um, presenting uh, problem in the context of their function so that we are not just understanding a behavior, but a behavior in context and that social context is, is central to that understanding um, behaviors. Um, it also empowers clients to cope with adverse environmental circumstances by in promoting coping self-efficacy, encourages the replacement of ineffective cognitive, affective, and behavioral responses, and it targets universal risk factors that are disproportionately affected, um, that, sorry, that disproportionately affect minoritized groups. And some of the strategies that may be particularly well suited are that um, CBT strategies encourage adaptive reactions to stigma. Um, they draw upon personal resilience um, and it can facilitate learning strategies for combating discrimination-based stress reactions, such as internalized homophobia or rejection sensitivity. So helping to bolster people um, against internalizing uh, stigma. Um, some, some, some broad clinical uh, principles um, when uh, applying CBT are first to normalize mental health consequences of discrimination and stigma-based stress, um, to rework negative cognitions that stem from early and ongoing minority stress experiences, um, work to empower clients to communicate openly and assertively across contexts, um, and validate unique strengths. So think, considering past resilience and coping and challenges um, that an individual has faced or, or learned along the way. Um, and mostly to affirm healthy and rewarding experiences of sexuality um, and not to pathologize sexual behavior um, and also facilitate supportive relationships. So thinking about how connected is, is somebody to their social to social supports that are affirming and supportive to help navigate the post-traumatic context. Um, so these are um, skills that have been pulled out by uh, Jonathan Pachinkis, um, Kelly's grad advisor, <laughs> um, on sort of some, some techniques that, that can be used um, in targeting oppression-based stress specifically. The first is consciousness raising, self-affirmation, emotional awareness and acceptance, um, restructuring of discrimination, stigma-based cognitions, decreasing avoidance and social isolation, and providing assertiveness training. Um, and um, not surprisingly, uh, two of these are inherently part of all, all, all evidence-based treatments for PTSD involve um, restructuring some of these cognitions, or decreasing avoidance. So really thinking about um, the overlap between oppression-based stress techniques and techniques to address traumatic stress, there seems to be a natural um, extension here to applying these um, skills more um, widely. Um, let's get this here. So this is a um, conceptual treatment model um, from our colleagues at the VA. Um, and this was designed for adults, but certainly could be adapted um, when thinking about the breadth of assessment uh, for children and families. Um, so really thinking about not just restricting our assessment of trauma to criterion A trauma, so events that involve life threat, serious injury, or sexual violence, but also have broadening the assessment for discrimination or microaggression exposures, um, and then getting at these um, both sort of distal and proximal or internalized stress responses. Um, and understanding the landscape of trauma and discrimination-based stress and the, the overlap and uh, in, in some ways the distinctions can help develop a treatment plan that, um, that duly addresses uh, the, um, the discrimination-based stress and the traumatic stress symptomatology. Um, and then the other thing, we'll get into more detail in a little bit, but one thing to say as well is that this doesn't lose sight of the context of when we think about uh, individual's experience, understanding the social context in which that is happening is really essential to understanding if that type of responding is adaptive, meaning protective in that environment, 
um, or problematic in that it, it might have some consequences in the short or long term. Um, and most importantly, um, we, we do want to, as clinicians, assess the relevance of identity. Um, we don't want to assume that it is the centerpiece to the focus of treatment. And we also don't want to assume that it's irrelevant. And so like most things in the clinical world, the middle way is the best way. Um, so there is um, a collaborative aspect of treatment planning that's inherent in CBT um, that does require the clinician to do a little legwork to understand how aspects of identity might be related or not related to the presenting problem and how aspects of identity might need to be integrated into the treatment plan. Um, so I, I will take a quick sidebar, but I, I promise to bring us back. Um, so I recently did a study where we were looking at the CAPS assessment for PTSD, which is a gold standard assessment, a clinician administered interview um, for PTSD among trans and gender diverse adults. Um, and we were just curious observationally where in this assessment of PTSD does gender identity or expression enter, enter the picture. Um, and so, you know, the risk of being very uh, rigid or strict with our diagnosis of PTSD is that um, we, it might lead to the under detection of symptoms where we might dismiss symptoms that are linked closely to discrimination based events that don't meet criterion A. And on the other hand, it may over pathologize minoritized groups. Um, and so the, the, we have not figured out, <laughs> and that is exactly where, where Kelly and I live, is in this space of how do we broaden conceptual models and improve assessment to um, understand distress and need for clinical supports while not missing people and not over pathologizing. Um, and we don't have time for this to dive into the nuance of all of that, um, feel free to sidebar me on it at another time. <laughs> um, but what at the minimum, what this means is that we need to provide culturally responsive PTSD assessment and that it should understand the social context of trauma um, when, when evaluating um, whether distress um, is, is something that should be uh, focused on in the PTSD treatment planning. Um, and so for... Uh, so what we did in this assessment was um, we delivered it to 44 participants. And, and of note, we were recruiting um, trans and gender diverse adults. Um, and trauma exposure was not a requirement for participation. However, 100% of those in, who enrolled in the study met um, had exposure to at least one criterion A. Um, half met criteria for PTSD. And 42% selected a discrimination-based traumatic event as their index event. So thinking about the ways in which discrimination often does rise to that criteria of PTSD, it seems very central to the, the treatment plan um, focused on, on trauma. And um, what we did in, these, in our qualitative coding process of these interviews is we... Um, our codes kind of fell in two buckets. One were validity codes. So these were things that might threaten the assessment or accuracy of, of PTSD assessment. Um, and then context codes. So these are um, broader codes that really inform sort of the need for broad, broader cultural competency um, or, or uh, socially responsive treatment um, in, that, in that regard. And so the validity codes, you know, just some of which are, are interesting. This, this is really looking at a deeper dive of how does minority stress show up. So one is identifying events that are not criterion A, but the other is really just the experience of um, clients not being able to disentangle where their distress is coming from. I mean, PTSD is the only disorder where we require people to anchor the distress to an event. And it's it seems so strange that we would require somebody to um, try to characterize whether chronic pervasive rejection and discrimination are driving symptoms versus a discrete, you know, high, high, you know, um, high severity event that happened one time. And, and that we can't expect clients to do that. We can't expect clinicians to do that with just probing <laughs> um, questions. So just really important to think about the experiences of what's causing what and, and very often, 
uh, clients are talking about um, recent or proximal or recent discrimination events as triggering um, PTSD symptoms, but those are still anchored in an original trauma, right? And so there, there's like so much um, messiness going on in trying to anchor events to symptoms. And so um, that plays out in a lot of different ways in the assessment. Um, and then um, participants also talk about responses after a trauma, sort of having a, a lack of affirming supports um, after a, a sexual assault, for example, um, you know, due to past experiences of rejection by that person, you know, like a, a rejecting family member, you know, would not be someone this person could turn to in, in the healing process after an event. And then finally, sort of the 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 mix up in terms of clients' description of body de detachment, which is part of PTSD or dissociation, and gender dysphoria. In some ways, clients were not able to distinguish whether those experiences were triggered by, you know, uh, microaggressions or by a sexual assault experience. And so the things get muddy. And, and so the, the goal here really is to think conceptually about the overlap and distinctions because we want to be more precise in our treatment so that we can make sure we're targeting um, all of the all of the things that might be driving the stress. And I'll just take one second on the context codes. These are broad categories, so just understanding exclusion and rejection experiences, understanding gender dysphoria more broadly and gender affirming services, and um, the clinician needing to understand structural discrimination and social determinants. And so these are our broad um, recommendations that are, um, are already existing in the field. So we, we look to diva, uh, dive a little diaper, diaper. <laughs> I have a baby, uh, deeper <laughs> onto um, the specific aspects of, of PTSD assessment. And so that, that moves me to the, the treatment piece of things. So really thinking about what are the core components of evidence-based treatments for PTSD and which pieces of these need to be adapted or expanded um, to a broader conceptualization of discrimination-based stress and traumatic stress. Um, and the core components listed here are psychoeducation, anxiety reduction and management, exposures, and cognitive restructuring. Um, I know this is a child audience, so I assume that the familiarity here might be with TFCBT. Um, which in, includes um, very similar interventions to adult models with the addition of parenting skills um, and conjoint parent youth sessions. So yeah, first I'm gonna talk about exposure-based interventions for PTSD. Um, so, you know, most exposure-based interventions and a lot of this talking about prolonged exposure, but other exposure-based interventions too, is based on emotion processing theory. And so this means that it's the idea that if you continuously engage with the trauma memory and with feared stimuli that's associated with the trauma memory, um, you eventually will uh, decrease to stress related to that and then can alter also alter cognitions that are related about the trauma, about uh, related stimuli, and also about the emotional reactions that people have to the trauma and to related stimuli. Um, so, you know, while these exposure-based therapies work extremely well for addressing trauma-related symptomatology, recovery and treatment among LGBTQ plus people maybe a little bit more complica complicated due to the ongoing experience of oppression-based stress and the higher likelihood of experiencing um, other forms of victimization. A really core component of emotion processing theory and exposure-based work um, assumes that the environment is safe for individuals. And that's an assumption that can't always be made for LGBTQ plus individuals. So you have to do a lot of thinking about um, what is actually being targeted, because it's very important that we're targeting, you know, the association that is connected to the trauma memory or to related stimuli that maybe is objectively safe, and we aren't doing anything to remove adaptive responses to truly objectively unsafe situations. 
in exposures. Another thing that I think about a lot with exposure-based work is um, that exposure-based work can also be helpful in challenging cognitions that people might have about their emotions that they're experiencing. So a lot of times people who've experienced trauma and people who've experienced discrimination might develop beliefs about you know, not being able to control their emotions or not being able to handle their emotions. And a lot of times exposure-based work can help challenge some of those cognitions and also create feelings of mastery and also self-efficacy to be able to engage with and experience really difficult emotions. Um, another thing that uh, Dr. Valentine was talking about um, that we'll talk about more specifically with examples, but a lot of things that I like to do with exposure-based work with LGBTQ plus individuals is figure out, you know, what type of avoidance is keeping them from accessing affirming environments, social supports, and trying to figure out different kind of exposure exercises to overcome that avoidance to help increase the support that they have in their life. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. I'll give more kind of specific examples. All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about safety first. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you know, to do exposure-based work, there is an assumption that people's environment is objectively safe and that doing exposure-based work in situations where the person is not objectively safe is contraindicated. So establishing safety is really the number one priority. Um, and this, you know, is an important thing to do in conversation in the beginning with LGBTQ plus people and just people in general. Uh, and if safety in the environment is not there, then the first part of treatment is really going to be figuring out how can we create safety in the environment? Is that connecting people to other resources? Is that working on um, some type of, you know, self-empowerment? Is that uh, engaging with case management? to make sure that this person has everything that they need to have their environment be safe. So that's really the first thing. Uh, Cause again, we don't want to extinguish anyone's adaptive responses to truly unsafe situations. And we don't want to, yeah, get rid of their adaptive responses that are actually keeping them objectively safe currently. So this, this slide shows a traditional kind of hierarchy that someone might make in prolonged exposure. Um, and then I'll go through a couple of recommendations that we like to uh, do when people are going through prolonged exposure. So the first one's going to be on the next slide, which shows adding a um, safety column to the exposure hierarchy. So this safety column represents the actual safety of whatever the activity is that's on uh, the hierarchy. Um, and this is something that we recommend that clients do with, or therapists do with the client. This should be a collaborative process. And I also like to make the point that the client is the ultimate decider of what is safe and what goes in this actual safety column. Um, with that though, I think it is also clinician's duty to, you know, make themselves aware of the environment that they live in and also the client lives in so that they can be more aware of like what might be objectively safe situations or activities based on that environment. So they can also help offer either resources or recommendations if a client is having difficulty with that. If you go to the next slide, um, this is related to this, but I think it's important to discuss not only like what the activity is going to be, but specifications around it. So that might be what neighborhood is this activity gonna happen in? What time of day? You know, things that we often do with clients anyway, but that kind of knowledge of what the environment might be like for this individual and also having a conversation about it and showing that in the actual safety column can all make clients feel um, much more heard and that their safety is actually a priority here. Um, and we really don't want to be putting people in situations that they are unsafe. Um, if you can go to the next slide. The next thing uh, that is recommended is also adding different activities that are going to be affirming or different community activities that might increase support. Uh, 
again, I mentioned like a good part about exposure is you can really target avoidance that might be keeping people from accessing support or accessing affirming spaces. So figuring out what that's going to be. Um, and again, this is so client specific. Um, you know, including different kind of affirming activities and things like that that might be of interest to the client can be so helpful for fostering pride, for helping people explore their identities, for um, helping to explore what gender euphoria might be like. And this has to be really, you know, client driven. Um, we don't want to, you know, put people in any situations that um, they may not be interested in exploring. We don't want to put pressure on people or anything like that. Uh, these can be really difficult situations for people and can be very anxiety provoking and very shame provoking. Um, so having conversations with clients about what their interests are, what their values are and helping to provide support there and see if you can find activities that are consistent with that. Um, relatedly, uh, conversations about outness are also really important to cross uh, coming up with different types of exposures. And I think one thing to point out about outness is that outness can look different for every person. Um, you know, I think we have an idea often about like what more like westernized kind of like outness looks like or what outness looks like in specific cultures, but really it's up to the person for what their life looks like and what outness looks like in their life. Um, so really making that as client centered as possible and having ongoing conversations about outness across different settings, right? So this might be with friends, this might be at work, this might be at school, um, this might be at home, and having conversations about levels of comfort and outness across all those different settings, while also um, having conversations, like I mentioned before, about the way that you know concealment can be helpful for avoiding um, risk or avoiding uh, anything that might be unsafe about being out in certain situations and that is very real and very valid and it also can come with costs of you know feeling disconnected from other people or um, different kind of psychological costs so having you know conversations with clients about that and also providing skills to help with that um, if people are struggling um, I'm trying to check my notes, see if I missed anything, because I know this is a very important part that can be really difficult to navigate to. Um, you can see on the hierarchy, you know, I have a couple of different activities that might be affirming, and also they kind of range in um, kind of growing into more like independence. Uh, but this could look very different depending on the person who's coming in. Um, some people might not be interested in going to a support group or anything like that. And so it's really meeting the client where they're at and finding activities that will be helpful for them and affirming for them. All right. So another part that I wanna point out that's not about the exposure hierarchy, and Dr. Valentine got at this a little bit, is talking about um, whether there is trauma relatedness uh, to identity, uh, assessing that in the beginning, and then also talking about that in imaginal exposures. Um, because if people are having beliefs about um, why the event happened to them, or you know, having beliefs about the impact that the event has had on them, then really exploring that and how that's related to their identity in imaginal exposures is gonna be important for processing that information. Right. And then lastly, um, this isn't talked about much in just the context of normal like exposure-based interventions, but um, it is, you know, things that is common in CBT and that uh, Pachinkas includes in all of his CBT uh, trials um, is providing different uh, coping skills for if clients experience oppression-based stress while you're working with them and how to um, respond and cope with that kind of stress. You know, in general, um, this might be helping people learn to kind of like redirect their attention or engage in kind of coping activities that can help bring them down to baseline. You know, even if threats are, you know, real and um, reactions are completely justified, that increase in stress can have an impact on mental health and physical health. And so it can be helpful for coming up with what are different kind of uh, strategies to cope with that stress. Um, 
and you know identifying things that might be helpful or less helpful like substance use um i also like to figure out like how do individuals want to respond to that and potentially help practice some of those responses if that's helpful for people and then also identifying resources in their community whether that's friends whether that's family um, whether that's you know certain groups online that people can turn to if they have these experiences to help uh, get support and validation and then also identify if there's any activities that clients can engage in to feel more empowered if they're experiencing situations that are very disempowering. All right. Okay, so changing uh, modalities a little bit. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about expressive writing and this is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, it's actually uh, what the intervention is based on that my career development award uh, will be testing. Um, so expressive based writing is, or expressive writing is just the basically paradigm of writing about thoughts and feelings related to a traumatic or stressful event. Um, this can be things like criterion A trauma or it can be things like LGBTQ plus based discriminatory events. Um, it was originally developed as a lab based paradigm and uh, actually as a neutral control. And then they found that, oh, when we have people write about stressful and traumatic events, their emotional well being gets better and actually their health gets better. And so since then, clinicians have thought, okay, well, let's try to make this a clinical intervention. So have, you know, adapted it in certain ways to be more appropriate to be delivered clinically. Um, and so, uh, you know, one intervention that's based off of this is written exposure therapy, which is an evidence-based treatment for PTSD. It uses structured writing um, about the traumatic event to reduce distress. But it also, expressive writing has been used specifically on uh, discrimination events. Um, so Pachankis and colleagues in 2021 and in 2015, he's done two now uh, clinical trials on using um, expressive writing for LGBTQ plus based discrimination um, and had people write about it for three sessions, actually independently by themselves and showed that there were reductions in anxiety, depression, stress, and also that there were uh, reductions in more like internal stress reactions. So it actually showed increases in pride in their identity and also their comfort with um, level of outness. So in the next slide, I have just a couple of examples of the writing prompts that actually Pachankis used in his clinical trial. But one thing to point out about these prompts is, you know, this, this writing strategy can be used kind of like standalone. So Pachankis had people do it independently. They did it online and they wrote for three days based on these writing prompts. Um, people have also done it as being assigned like as homework in therapy. So like between sessions, having people write about an experience, um, but it could also be done in session. So you have time to process it after the writing. So here are some examples of prompts. And as you can see, a lot of them are, you know, it's really asking people to write about the event, write about their deepest emotions related to it, write about their thoughts related to it. And then the third prompt is starting to move people towards meaning making to think about um, how writing about this relates to their current situation and also how it makes them think about their future. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, just a couple of recommendations for about after a writing session, you can do a brief check in with people, see how writing went, how you would do normally, you know, after an exposure anyway. Um, but one important thing is kind of keeping this check in brief. Uh, a lot of, you know, what the meat of the intervention is, is actually the writing. And so that process has already occurred. So checking in is really, you know, learning about how that experiences was from them and um, not undoing kind of any of the processing that already happened. Okay, hey. um, and I'm gonna switch gears and focus more on the cognitive aspects. And of course, it's not one or the other. Very often in PTSD treatment, we are doing exposures and then we realize in the processing that there's cognitive changes happening. And so um, just wanna spend some time on sort of the flip side here. 
Um, so the cognitive model of PTSD suggests that PTSD is the result of incomplete emotional or cognitive processing of a trauma memory. And that trauma leads to extreme or unhelpful beliefs about the trauma, the world, or other people. Um, and that there are common themes that emerge from, from trauma exposure. Um, and those involve safety, trust, power, control, intimacy, and self-esteem. Um, and some of, um, some of my research has also looked at the way in which discrimination experiences and, and rejection can lead to similar um, types of cognition. So really thinking about the way in which our interventions are targeting these cognitions and at the origin or sort of where that the readies come from um, can be from various types of interpersonal harm. Um, and so I think it's totally fair game to loop these into cognitive restructuring work that we're doing um, already and sort of be more inclusive of cognitions that might reflect internalized stigma in particular. My arrow key literally popped off my keyboard. <laughs> so hold on. Um, and so this is just a, a brief case, case example um, of a 20-year-old gay man, uh, first experience with childhood sexual assault at age 10. And this was a cognitive processing therapy um, well, based on a CPT case. Um, and in CPT, we um, assign a written impact statement about the trauma, and we use the written impact statement as a way to identify cognitions that we might target through cognitive restructuring. Um, so the, the, pro the statement says, I got myself into this situation that I ended up not wanting. I invited the situation with nonverbal cues due to my curiosity. I'm open and trusting person from the get-go. I'm independent and adventurous. I was sexually curious at a young age. I knew I was different from other kids at that age. This was the first person to look, um, to look at me the way I looked at him. I'm spontaneous. I'm attractive. They found me attractive. I was mature at a young age and very intuitive to situations. I was aware of my sexual feelings towards men and frustrated and alone with these thoughts. For the first time, I didn't feel alone. So I jumped at the opportunity to get more experience to better understand my sexuality. An adult took advantage of the situation by seeking sexual activities with me as a child uh, who did not know better. I trusted an adult and he broke that trust and I felt pressure to do things I didn't want to do. I wasn't a consenting adult. Um, so as you might see, might hear here, there, there's actually a lot of balanced thinking and some extreme thinking coming out of the, there's usually a mix, right? And so you want to validate um, adaptive responding that you're hearing in an impact statement and really just zoom in on um, things that might be causing distress. And so it's not a one-to-one -one translation. There's a whole technique that you have to use in session to get to these stuck points, but these are some example stuck points or extreme cognitions that came out of the impact statement. I am bad. I am worthless. The abuse is my fault. I'm powerless in sexual situations. If I assert, assert my own needs, I'll be rejected. I'm only good for sex. So thinking about self-objectification um, or sex is the only way for me to, to connect with other men. Um, and so really thinking about which of these are, are driving distress and shame. And some of these reflect internalized stigma, particularly um, esteem related cognitions. And to, to dive a little deeper here. So I think that this is where it takes some finesse <laughs> to bring in social context and it, it, and there is a lot of skill building involved here in identifying what kind of cognition might you challenge um, through a cognitive strategy and which would you not challenge, right? And, and again, our, our default is to understand, is this belief harmful in some way to the person who's holding that belief? And so, for example, if someone says gay people are more likely to be abused, we do not challenge that. We validate that. We actually know that there is a, a, a wide disparity in exposure. Um, and if the cognition is something more like, I was abused because I am gay, that's a maybe. That's a place where the clinician should ask clarifying questions because in some ways it is true that, you know, gay kids are targeted for abuse because of their, their social exclusion and, and vulnerability in that regard. 
Um, and so doesn't, this is ask more questions, get to a different stuck point. Now, the, the third column here is abuse made me gay and I am damaged, right? That is just very clearly a trauma-related stuck point that is also reflective of internalized stigma. And so here, the focus is how do we challenge these cognitions um, and also um, help to uh, not just challenge them to adopt a, a healthier um, self-view. Um, and I'm happy to share the slides with you because this is a very clunky table, but and I, and I, I do um, hope you have time to review it in, in more detail later, but I wanna get a little bit more in depth on some of the techniques here. So for that stuck point abuse made me gay, one way to challenge that is to provide some psychoeducation around the link between sexual arousal um, and response is not necessarily an indication of enjoyment or consent. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, this cognition that abuse made me gay, well, were all gay men abused, right? Sort of really sort of challenging some of that thinking around there, there are exceptions to the rule. And if believing that abuse made you gay means that you feel that you are damaged and you can't be a gay man without holding on to that damage, um, that can certainly be very problematic um, for, for a person's functioning. Um, and then sometimes we just don't get far with challenging the accuracy of beliefs, but we get further if we're thinking about what are the consequences of believing that. Um, and I think people really, really move when you get to the, what are the consequences or the costs of holding on to that belief? Um, you see this also around trust. Like we would understand why you wouldn't trust anyone given the experiences you've had in your life, but what is the cost of not trusting anyone? Um, and then often they're able to say, you know, social isolation, um, you know, depression, um, suicidality even. Um, so really thinking about the, the cost of holding on to some of these beliefs. Um, for the sake of getting to TFCBT, I'm going to just skip right ahead. Um, this is a, a, a TFCBT manual that's actually been adapted for um, sexual and gender minority youth. Um, and it applies a strengths-based and harm reduction framework for, to help caregivers understand the impact of their reactions on youth, um, as well as some modifications to TFCBT components. Um, and very similarly, they recommend, um, th they recommend very similar types of adaptations to exposure-based work and cognitive aspects, but I, I do want to just sort of drill in to um, the focus on psychoeducation, particularly psychoeducation to parents and caregivers of um, the impact of their um, bias and um, rejection may have on their child's well-being. Um, and then also going through, you know, parenting skills, like how do you support a youth, youth's autonomy? How do you help a youth navigate um, systems in which they were, are likely experiencing discrimination? Um, and how do you um, empower, like bolster a, a child's um, self-esteem and, and really think about self, self-worth that may, might be impacted by internalized stigma? And they have, uh, and, and here we have conjoint youth parent sessions. And so as you imagine, this would be highly tailored to the, the dyad um, and uh, really thinking about parental support and acceptance as, as the ultimate goal, um, and also um, educating the parents at the same time around trauma-related cognitions and how they intersect with identity-based um, uh, cognitions as well. Um, and also thinking about as a clinician being being a limit setter, you know, in that session to ensure that there's not additional harm being done within the context of therapy, and you might decide to discontinue joint sessions. Um, and, and of course, there's a whole lot to navigate or unpack there. Um, but ultimately, the idea here is to have, um, in the best scenario, parent engagement and support, um, and in the worst scenario, creating a safe space for that child um, and, and navigating uh, as an advocate for them. Um, Kelly? 
So we covered a lot. <laughs> uh, I was reflecting on that as we were going through that. I was like, oh, this is kind of a lot of information. Um, but I think, I think at least some of the key takeaways as we talked about, you know, why psychi- psychiatric disparities exist among LGBTQ plus individuals, why they have this heightened risk for um, different uh, mental and health difficulties, that it's really driven by discrimination and stigma-based stress. Um, and even though we don't have treatments, we have treatments that target discrimination and stigma-based stress from a cognitive behavioral framework. And we also have interventions for PTSD and trauma-related symptoms. Um, we don't have any interventions that are currently inclusive of the two that focus both on PTSD and trauma-related symptoms that also target discrimination and stigma-based stress. And so really a lot of what our recommendations were, were reviewing, you know, what about the CBT-based psychotherapies that focus on discrimination and stigma-based stress um, can we use uh, in PTSD evidence-based psychotherapies? Like how can we adapt the EBP evidence-based psychotherapies for PTSD using what we know about uh, cognitive behavioral therapies specifically for discrimination and stigma-based stress? How do we make these treatments more inclusive? Um, And a couple of the adaptations that we went over uh, was one, ensuring safety in a collaborative manner uh, and having it be an ongoing conversation and talking about safety across many different settings that the client might live in. Uh, Targeting avoidance, that is keeping people from engaging in supportive environments and keeping them from engaging in uh, values-based and consistent activities or being able to access more affirming um, supports or environments. And that can be really helpful. Uh, And then to also target you know, shame-inducing trauma-related cognitions uh, using Socratic questioning and restructuring. I love Dr. Valentine's table of, you know, when to validate, when to ask more questions, um, and then when to, you know, engage in restructuring. And so my summary of it is validate the valid. You know, a lot of what people are coming in is extremely valid. That's their lived experience, and we want to make sure that we validate that. Um, and then also be able to, you know, identify when some beliefs might not be helpful for people and helping people um, come to that conclusion too in a collaborative manner and think together what might be more helpful to think in this situation. These might be things related to safety, rejection, and exclusion might be very valid um, concerns that people are bringing in. And so um, making sure we recognize that and we're not going after uh, beliefs that are 100% valid and keeping people safe. Anything else, Dr. Valentine, that you think would be helpful? Oh, I think that was great. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, could I uh, ask you to stop sharing and then we'll see more yep. of each other? Thank you so much. That was an <laughs> excellent talk, Dr. Valentine and Dr. Harper. Um, and um, we do have a couple comments in the in the chat. I, I do want to highlight your last point that we don't have to scrap everything that we know about CBT or throw away CBT in order to meet um, the um, the needs of, of a diverse population of clients, as we should be doing. Um, so really appreciate that that note. Um, so um, I like to open it up. Um, I I know Dr. Guerrero, you had a question here. I don't know if you're still with us. It's hard for me to figure out who who's who here. I'm here. Uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, Great okay. presentation, by the way. Thrilled by the work that you all are doing. I just had a couple of questions that I sent to you. Yeah. Yep. So I, I see, I think you're, so in, in my study using the CAPS, those were adults only and 25%, oh, 25% were my, minoritized racial and ethnic groups. Um, oh, okay. So not not as diverse as um, we would like, but I will say that a lot of the, um, there has been a lot of work in parallel to look at uh, the contribution of racism and racism-based stress on PTSD. And I would refer you to uh, Monica Williams, who's the the -hmm. lead person that I'm following in terms of understanding how to broaden the conceptualization. And I, you know, I work at Boston Medical Center um, and I am building in assessments of 
racism-based stress into all of my PTSD studies to, to better understand um, how, how that uh, responds to our, our treatments for PTSD, um, just observationally to begin with, but really thinking about building out services for oppression-based stress specifically, even outside of PTSD. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, feel free to unmute yourself or put a question in the chat. We only have a couple of minutes, so go fast. I can't see everyone. We have so many people here. So um, <laughs> I have a question um, for Drs. Valentine and Harper. Um, I am interested in um, hearing about maybe some examples of how you've managed um, like patient client regression or, or just kind of a, a, a setback while doing um, exposure and um, so, so that's like the, there, there's a, there's a clinic, like uh, curious about how you've managed that clinically, like in, in the therapy room. And then also curious about like how you might um, account for that in, in like a research protocol, um, like in terms of progress, like if progress, the outcome being like uh, lower SUDs or mastery or something like that, like there, there might be just expected regression or increased distress. Um, so yeah, yeah, I have a, research and a uh, clinical clinical uh, question about that. Well, I can take the research one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I haven't done a clinical trial yet, but you know, I think just one thing to think about with outcomes when doing this work is to have as broad of trans kind of diagnostic outcomes as possible, you know, Trauma impacts a lot of different areas of people's life and so does discrimination and the two can intersect in the way that they're going to impact an array of difficulties that people might have. So if we're only focusing on a reduction in PTSD symptoms, we might be completely missing other aspects of a person's life that actually is showing a lot of change. And so that's also including things related to their identity. So measures of like internalized stigma, measures of... Um, rejection sensitivity, those kinds of things to see if there might be change over time. Because um, right, there might be some areas that we're not seeing change, but other areas we might be seeing a lot of change that we might be missing if we really limit what our outcomes are. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if some of your question is also about the elevation of distress that might come from particularly exposure-based work. Um, and I think the important part of for all clinicians is to create a safe space to where we might be, uh, a client may be distressed in, in the clinical interaction based on being exposed to a trauma memory or reminders. Um, but that level of distress is no higher than the types of re-experiencing they might be um, experiencing in their day-to-day. -day. And, they're, and they're, for most part, are quite resilient, able to manage that. And so there is a lot of like cheerleading and bringing people back in. <laughs> Um, but I will say that also, like, we do know that when provided access to EBTs um, and access to therapy, that LGBTQ plus people really get, like, take to therapy <laughs> at, a, at a higher rate as well. So just important to note that you have to set the stage in the right way and do the hard thing, um, but that people really do feel like they're getting targeted treatment when their clinician has... Um, created that space for it. Well, you certainly set the stage for us. Um, this was such an informative talk, such a great balance of, of uh, great empirical work and also good training for all of us um, in how to adapt. It was incredibly um, helpful and, and comprehensive and you hit all the marks. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So appreciate your work, Dr. Harper and Dr. Valentine. Um, I'm sorry we have to end, we're a little over. I wanna be respectful of your time um, everyone take good care um, and good afternoon or good evening, wherever coast you're at. Thank you, Dr. Harper and Dr. Valentine. Thank you so much for having us. Bye.